Mr. Daryl L. Frank. And you can tell him what CAS means. Thank you. Okay, thanks for staying in, hanging in there. It's been a long day for everybody. Um, I was asked to come and talk about production sound mixing, um, but did not talk about the technical aspects of production sound mixing. So, um, so I guess what I want to do is try to talk about just basically for the students involved here that are here, how to get into the field, how to you know work through the field, and what you do as a job and things like that. So basically, just like to re to reiterate what we were said, my job is to record everything on the set. Um, production sound mixing. So I have to take, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment and drag it out in the desert or wherever we're at and try to record something usable. And that's my job. So here we go. So, okay, so let's start with education. Um, a lot of people ask me, or I get asked all the time, what should you do or where should you go or should you go to school? And I really don't have an answer for that because I think it's up to you individually. Um, depends on your situation, um, depends on your, your family life, how old you are. I mean, some people are coming back from, from coming from other careers into the film industry, so maybe school isn't, isn't in for you. So maybe a trade school, maybe the CMT programs or things which are, in my opinion, are much better than the bigger universities because they teach you what you're gonna learn. What you're gonna learn is what you're gonna use in the field, and that's what you want. You wanna go to a school that, the or wherever you learn from. You want to learn from stuff that's going to be valuable for your, for your career out in the field. So one of the things I would look at is your school is how many of these people that graduate from this program, do they go out and work? Or do they go and do other things? So that's something to consider. And the other thing is it's just make sure if it's right for you. It's because it's, it's different for everybody. A lot of people, there's not a lot of people, but some people never went to school for any of these things fields, camera operators, whatever you want to do it. And they've done great. And some people have not. So it's, it's, it's either or. It's up to you. But just make sure what you find is in your education hands-on because lecturing is not going to do it for you. You need the hands-on experience. Um, so then moving into jobs, how to get a job. Where do the jobs come from? Um, production sound mixing jobs aren't in the newspaper. Um, and usually they're not even listed. By the time they're listed, usually they're already hired somebody. The crew's usually set by the time you hear about it or whatever. So you have to be really on top of all the different type of things. One of the, the better ways of doing it is probably referrals from other people, from jobs you've done, other people you've worked with. They, you know, put your name in the hat and said, you know, they've worked with somebody and they liked them or they got along with them or that kind of thing. Um, another way is um, the union office. Um, the union office can help you because movies and TV shows are under union contracts and so being part of the union you get that knowledge up front and that can help you. Doesn't mean you're going to get a job, doesn't mean they hire you for the job, it just gives you the awareness, the, the knowledge that a job is coming. Um, I talked about, well I didn't talk about, but different online sites, there's um, some different crewing sites or different listing sites that you can pay for that have um, different jobs and things that are coming into production that you can be aware of. Social media has turned into a huge thing, for, especially for sound, because we, as sound mixers, don't ever see each other. We're maybe once a year we get together for a convention or something like that, and you see people and you can exchange knowledge. But now with the internet and social media groups and things like that, you can talk and you can exchange knowledge and, and stay up on top of the field. Um, one of the sites, uh, JW Sound, is a Jeff Wexler site in LA. He is, that's probably the most comprehensive sound site. It's about eight, 9,000 people that are on it. And it's just sound people talking about sound issues from you know, their basic day-to-day -day life to equipment to whatever it's just affecting their, li their jobs. So if you are into um, the sound field or you want to get, learn more about sound, that's a great one to go to. The RAMP site is a um, true audio site. It's just called RAMPS. And it's the same kind of thing. It's just a discussion group for sound, sound people. Um, let's see. Oh, I talked about the union earlier. Um, IATSE 480 is the local union that, um, that I belong to, and that's the New Mexico uh, Studio Mechanics Union. And it is required that if you work on a TV show 
or a movie that you're a union member because this is not a right to work state as of yet. We'll see what happens in the next coming legislation. Um, and what that means is, I mean, for studio mechanics is, is that it covers everything except for camera. Camera is the only, the only department that's not covered under the studio mechanics. So, which is really nice because if you're young and you're coming into the union, you can come in and you decide a year or so into whatever you came in as, you don't like it. You just don't like it. It's not really what you like, but you saw this job over here that you might want to try. So you can do that. You can change your, your craft. It's not like you're just a camera operator or just a sound mixer or whatever. You can, you can change those things, especially if you get the job and you can keep the job. That's basically what it comes down to. Um, the other thing is health and welfare benefits. Um, a lot of people lately are very negative against unions and things like that, but if you go back and look, uh, unions are the reason we have an eight hour work or an eight hour work day on a normal day, on a normal workplace, and overtime and all those kind of things. And health and welfare and benefits and retirement are all great things, especially as you get older. And they're really things, especially for your younger people, think about it, don't put it off, do it now. You know, find out all the things you need to find out about it because you don't want to play playing catch up in that kind of, in that kind of field. Um, the equipment, um, there's a, a lot of equipment involved in sound mixing in the field. Um, it changes daily, and whether it changes for good or bad, it just does, and you have to stay on top of that. And so you, whether you're involved with it or not, you just have to be involved with the knowledge, like these kind of things will really help you stay up to date, communicating with other people in the field, other professionals, seeing what they're doing and things like that. Um, as far as for like new peop new sound mixers, they always I always get this one. It's like, well, I don't have any equipment. You know, how do I do this job? Well, renting is a great way to get your foot in the door. It's a great way to get your to build up your equipment and you build up your resume and build up your client base and things like that. So um, then let's see challenges. Um, Challenges for sound mixers are various. Um, you're out in the environment, and so everything you're dealing with is things that you walk out the door and deal with. You walk into this room and you hear the fan noise from the projectors, and you hear the people talking on the cell phone or whispering in the corner. Um, a lot of those things you can't control, and a lot of those things you have to compromise with. It's not a perfect world. Um, the great advantage of the the post people is you get to sit in a nice air conditioned room and complain about what somebody didn't do earlier. <laughs> and sometimes that's true. Most of the time it's a, it's a reason for it and constantly a reason for it. And sometimes they can be the simplest things. Having a door open. Well, we want that door open. Well, the door's outside and we're inside. You know? There's, you know, so it's kind of a negotiation all the time as far as trying to um, negotiate your way through protecting, is, trying to, to minimize those background sounds and things like that. Um, larger use of tech, wireless technology is um, kind of a weird thing I put on there, but it, it's kind of a two, two-fold thing. Um, wireless technology in the last 20 years has come, it's come huge as far as the usage of wireless microphones. We use them every day. And we depend on them every day. And it's like a computer. They're great when they work, but when they don't work, you're kind of like uh, screwed and not in a good way. Um, so, so there's that. And so that's the advantage of that is it's made directors and DPs be able to shoot things that they couldn't shoot before. Because, what, because before, if you didn't have a boom in there, you couldn't hear them. And I'm sorry, if you can't hear them, you're not going to watch it. I don't care. If the sound sucks, you're not watching it. That's my opinion. Okay. Um, so the other hand of that on the wireless technology is that everything else is growing in wires, wireless technology. Everybody has a computer, has a pager, not a pager, but a phone that's communicating um, devices, you know, iPads, all those kind of things are all competing for bandwidth and, and frequency around the world. And at the same time, these technology companies are buying up these bandwidths so that space is becoming smaller and smaller. So what we're ending up with is a lot more people using the space in a lot narrower, narrower, narrower place. Um, for example, like on a set, everybody on a set has a walkie-talkie. 
Well, the walkie-talkie is about five watts of power. And if that stands next to, if I had a walkie-talkie here and I keyed it right here, it would just destroy the signal because it's overpowering it. And so now you've added 50, 60 people in the area of this stage that all have one of those things on their side, plus a cell phone. And then you're trying to use wireless technology to do your job. So it can be very challenging. And so that's something to keep in mind. Um, it's not magic. It sometimes appears to be magic, but there's usually a reason for it if the sound guy's freaking out, trying to get you to turn off your cell phone or not use it so close to everybody. So, um, but the bottom line of that is um, don't give up. Keep trying. There's usually an alternative. Sometimes it can sound very crazy, you know, to the point of someone stopping to do an action in the middle of an action, which. Um, can help you, you know, someone dropping things, reminding your actors not to do certain things because they're in the moment and they're not thinking about things that are really hurting themselves. And, and my job, or our job as sound people, sorry, is to try to prevent that and make it so they can get the most, we can get the most usable sound into post-production. Um, let's see. I think, okay. The Friends of Sound. The Friends of Sound was developed by a friend of mine in New York. She's a sound mixer um, who does the show Nurse Jackie. Um, and she gives out little buttons to, and little pins to people on the crew that she calls the, the Friends of Sound. And I never understood it. And one day she explained it to me, and it makes a lot of sense. And she explained it like this is that, you know, we're like someone was saying earlier that there's three people on the set at the most that are concerned about the sound. And maybe the director, maybe four. Um, and so if you don't have friends of sound, you've got 50 or 60 other people in other departments that they don't care about it either. So if you can't get them on your side, they're not going to be your friends. And each one of these people can every day can affect what you're doing on the set and it can affect the bottom line of the sound department. So if they want to be bad to the sound department, then you're going to have a bad day. But if you're your friends, then you're going to have a better day, you know, and they'll make you get through the day better that way. So um, that's kind of like, that's about all I have for this. Um, I wanted to leave a, a enough time because um, I know there's a lot of people that have questions, and I'm sure I covered a lot of stuff very quickly, and I think that's it. How much of the, the sound that you record out in the field actually makes it? Does it all make it on, or does it, do they do a lot of dubbing? Um, Especially in New Mexico, winds and all that? My experience is nowadays is if it works, if the production track works, everybody wants to keep the production track normally, and cost-wise and attitude-wise, they usually will fight for that as much as possible. That being said, there's a lot of people that would rather replace it and don't care about that. And that's easier for them and they don't care about how it sounds in the bottom. They basically really don't care and they don't, when you say, well, that's obvious that you replaced it. And they're like, so? People don't know. So I would say it, it depends on the show. And I would say for the most part, I try to think, you know, 90, 90 to 95%. A lot of shows, especially TV shows, they don't have time. So usually when they're replacing dialogue, it's because they wrote a different line after they said the line, or the actor didn't say it with the right inflection or whatever, and the director didn't care, or they didn't have time to, to, to do it. There's usually a lot of reasons for it. And usually sound takes the, the brunt of it, um, because you can replace sound. You can replace the dialogue later, and that's an uh, interesting tool that has become a detriment to people like me, because that's what you get. You get, you know, oh, we can replace it later. Well, it's never as good as everybody who listens knows and so, and that's not what we're trying for. So we try to just try to fight for that as much as you can. You have to be the fire, the, the crusaders, I guess, for sound on the set, if that answers your question. Somebody in the back there. Can you, uh, you said uh, you were talking about the difficulties of sound and you kind of went into a little, uh, little tidbits on kind of the challenges you faced. Are there any particular challenges that you can think of right now that you face that, uh, any solutions that you've come to with them, you know, like any challenges, uh, like, you know, those, those onset crisis situations or whatever <laughs> that you managed to fix? Okay. Um, what happened the night before last? 
we were shooting at a hotel in Central, and very, very noisy. And, they're locked, and the ADs locked up the road and everything, and it's still very noisy because of the environment, and it's Central on, you know, uh, you know that kind of restaurant noise and things like that. And we were shooting at this hotel, and we ended up shooting the last part of the scene. The camera was basically in the doorway shooting back at the, de at the, the people in the bedroom. And I said, I said, we really need to get that door closed. And OK, well, we'll do that. And 10, 15 minutes later, we were ready to shoot. And the door is wide open. And the camera is literally blocking the door. And I said to the director, I said, you know, this is not going to be good because you've got two people that are supposed to be doing like pillow talk in a bedroom. And now they sound like they're on central having pillow talk, which you can't hear them. You know, so which is going to mean that that whole side for that actor, she would have to ADR the whole scene, which is not, not a good thing. And really, it was just about closing the door. And when I asked the director, I said, you know, sir, <laughs> we should really close the door. And he said, the camera's in the door. We can't close the door. And I said, we should really close the door. And he said, we can't, we, and we just can't. And that's usually the answer I get is, we can't. We don't have time. we got to go. So I walked out of the room, I walked downstairs, and by the time I got back to where I was sitting, the door was closed, and we were rolling, and the door was closed. And I said, oh, okay, well, that was interesting. I guess they figured out how to way to close the door. So later on, I asked the DP, the next day I asked him about that, and I said, I go, what was the deal with the door? And he goes, there was no deal with the door. The camera was on wheels. We just moved the camera, and we closed the door. No big deal. And I said, well, what was the big deal? And he goes, I don't know. But nobody wanted to close the door until I said, close the door. And when he said close the door, you know, he became a friend of sound. <laughs> and it was that, that kind of thing. And that's, you know, with people. He had enough, because he listens. You know, he sits, he doesn't just watch the visual on the monitor. He listens to what he, we're hearing. And he wants to be able to hear the actors as well as see them. And a lot of DPs don't. They don't care about what it sounds like. They just will care about what it looks like. And so that helps. So that, that's where a friend or our foe becomes of the sound department. So. For, uh, yes, sir. Excuse me. For, for multi-channel sound in, a, in a, pr a production, do you have special microphones that you use in the field? Or do you do most of all the generation of the different tracks and editing? Um, well, my different tracks are basically if there's 10 people in the scene, there's probably 10, there's probably a lot of them on each actor, and then there's usually one or two boom microphones. So that's usually, a, or maybe a planter mic or so. So, you know, under 50, you know, between 15 and a couple. So, and as far as specialty goes, they're just basic, you know, high end shotgun microphones and lavalier microphones and things like that. What are the kind of techniques to hide a lav on an actor? What are they? Or yeah, what, what kind of techniques to hide one uh, do you ever do? <laughs> um, that's interesting because there's, there's so many things you can do, and it's, it's the kind of thing that it's a trial and error thing, and in what works for this person isn't going to work for the person next to him, and it might not even work for the same actor in the same wardrobe after lunch because there's a sweet spot or you found the right position or whatever, or the actor's doing something different. So it's kind of a trial and error thing. You have these, you know, tried and true things, little tricks that you come up with and things sh people show you, but you're constantly trying to reinvent the wheel and try to come up with new ideas and stuff like that. And sometimes they work and, you know, sometimes they don't, you know. Yeah, sometimes, you, you, a lot of times you try to tape it to them. Sometimes you can't tape it to them because they have allergies or they have allergic reactions to certain things. Um, clothing, um, hair, you know, we don't do too much hair mics anymore because it, we've kind of gotten away from that. But a lot of times, like in Broadway and things like that, they use a lot of hair mics, a lot of, a lot of that kind of things, because, you know, you're up here at a distance and having a microphone sitting here, you would never see it, but with HD technology and zoom lenses, you're going to see that every time on a camera. So there's a lot of things you can, depends, you know, a lot of things you can, you can do, you can't do in theater and vice versa for film and video. All right, so in, so in your department, do you work completely separate from Folly, or is it just everything you're doing is on set, correct? Correct. Okay, cool. So I'm basically um, like, um, hello, Kitty, and those guys were talking about people talking together and things like that. 
lately it hasn't, usually I get to talk to the editor before we start shooting, but that's even changed now because productions are moving so quickly and a lot of times they won't even hire a lot of these people until they're in the post-production stages of the project, which is really hard because a lot of their work is half of it's done already. You know, they have no pre-production and they're just picking up the pieces and trying to deal with so, what somebody did. And everybody works differently. It doesn't mean that you did it right or wrong, but it's just that everybody has a better, a different type of workflow and every job is different. So you kind of have to, that's why pre-production becomes real important as far as getting those things worked out. You guys must be sound guys. <laughs> yeah, well, we're film students, so. Okay. But um, yeah, uh, do you capture only dialogue, or do you uh, also have to capture all the little sounds that the actors do? Yeah, everything, everything that happens on set, you know, whether they use it or not is, is not my decision, but usually it, it it's might, you know, become the base of their tracks. Usually, especially with television, that'll be their base they'll start with, and they'll just add on to it. They usually don't take it away unless it's really something they don't want or they're trying to get rid of, you know, like working in junkyards and things like that, that they want to use the big metal thing that picks the big metal magnet that picks up cars and have actors stand underneath it and talk. They did that on Breaking Bad. It was not fun. <laughs> so, but, you, you know, you make it happen. You, you do what you can do, and that's, you know, at the, the end of the day, that's, you, you, you give them as much as... You feel good about what you gave them because you tried as hard as you can. It might not be a good day for you, but it's at least you know you tried. You know, you can't give up. So thank you. Woo! Appreciate it.